Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation's Preparing for Transplant webinar. We are glad that you're joining us this evening for this presentation. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. If at any point during the presentation you need technical assistance, please type your question into the chat window or the question box. If you have any audio issues, you should be able to switch between your computer speaker system and call, and call in on a phone number provided um, if you need to. So you should have those two options on your control panel. In order to provide the highest quality session today and to avoid any background noises, all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and welcome during the presentation. Questions can be submitted via the question box located on your control panel. We'll be taking questions periodically, so please submit your questions as you think of them, and uh, Dr. Rosano will be happy to answer them uh, throughout the presentation. The webinar is be being recorded this evening, and we will be posting it on our website, so you'll be able to access the information again and refer back to it if you needed to um, at a later date as well. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Rosano. Dr. Rosano attended medical school at the University of Arizona College of Medicine and Seattle Children's Hospital for his pediatric residency. He moved to Houston for pediatric cardiology fellowship training and there underwent additional fellowship training in cardiac intensive care and heart failure transplantation. While on the faculty of Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital, he obtained a Master's of Science degree in clinical research. He is currently the Medical Director for Heart Failure and Transplantation and Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania, where he is active in patient care, advocacy, and research. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Rosano. Thanks so much for being with us tonight, Dr. Rosano. Great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, can you, you can hear me okay? We can hear you, and I just switched over to your screen. Great. And the slides are up. Mm -hmm. It takes Hopefully. a second. I think it takes a little bit of a delay to actually come. I'm not seeing them quite yet, but I think that they will be coming soon. Okay. Okay, I can see them now. Yep. Okay. Great. Well, I'd like to again thank Gina and the Cardiopathy Foundation um, for um, organizing this and uh, um, you know, please, if you have any questions as the talk is um, is going, just um, just let me know. Just type them in, I guess. And all right, well, I will go ahead and um, get started. And so, what I was hoping to do today is just discuss um, a little bit about heart transplantation and talk about who we transplant and why. Um, what are uh, uh, the components of a transplant evaluation? and how we can keep a child well through the uh, transplant process. Uh, I have no relevant financial disclosures. So it is late in the day, and uh, some of you may be tired. And it's hard because I can't see you guys. I can usually see the people when I'm talking to them. So when I'm, when I'm talking to my cardiology fellows, I can see them when they're doing this, um, which happens not infrequently. But I will do my best to. Uh, keep this exciting and engaging and not have everybody fall asleep. All right, so uh, so one thing uh, to think about um, in heart transplant is uh, we, we generally transplant for people that have heart failure. So how big of a problem is this in uh, pediatrics? Well, it turns out it's a, it's a pretty big problem. So overall, if we look throughout the United States, there are somewhere between you know, about 14,000 nowadays, maybe up to about 16,000 admissions for heart failure every year. And on a population level, that's about 16 to 18 admissions per 100,000 children, which, you know, may not sound like a lot, but when uh, we talk about very serious uh, acute diseases uh, that require hospital admission um, that are, you know, very serious and, you know, can have a lot of morbidity and mortality. Heart failure is actually one of the more common. Uh, a severe sepsis is somewhere, you know, about 50 per 100,000 children. So, um, you know, it's not quite as common as sepsis, but it's um, it's really one of the more prevalent uh, serious uh, conditions of childhood. Um, when we look at what do these patients have, the 
the majority of patients have congenital heart disease. So about you know 60 to 70 percent have congenital heart disease, and that number is probably going up over time. And that's because of uh, we're very effective with surgeries to palliate some very serious forms of heart disease, but we oftentimes don't cure them, and uh, children will survive, but unfortunately survive with heart failure. And cardiomyopathies and myocarditis, which are you know both you know heart muscle diseases, make up about you know 15 to 20 percent of these overall admissions of heart failure, and that's that's fairly stable over time. You know we don't think the number of patients with cardiomyopathies are are probably increasing, and you know myocarditis is is something that that's um, that's relatively um, uh, relatively stable. Uh, but again, this is a very serious disease, and uh, one of the ways we can tell how serious it is is how long the children are in the hospital. So these are just, you know, one hospital admission for heart failure, and what is the average amount of time that a patient would be in the hospital? And you can see, as compared to adults, uh, children in the hospital, you know, a uh, much longer period of time. So, so this age zero, these are infants. You know, their their average hospital length of stay is nearly a month. It's, you know, 25 days. And even in, you know, uh, uh, older children, children 11 to 20, it's about 12 days. And that's that's greater even than the 70-year-old. And, you know, I mean, you know, a heart failure in a 70-year-old is a, that's a big deal and that's important. But they're, they're not in the hospital, you know, on average six days, which is, you know, about half of what a, what a 12-year-old is. So, Again, when we see heart failure in children, uh, when it's bad enough that requires hospitalization, um, it's it's a really serious disease, and and unfortunately, not only are these children in the hospital for a long time, uh, but their likelihood of not surviving that hospitalization is is you know quite high. Um, you know we. Uh, uh, the overall, you know, mortality is somewhere about you know six, seven percent, and you could say, well, that's great. You know, ninety-seven percent of the children survive, but you know, we would like it to be a hundred percent. And you know, if we think of something like the infants here that have an overall, you know, risk of death of about eleven percent, well, that's that, that's really, really high, and especially when you consider that you know. You know, less than one half of one percent of all children who enter a hospital um, don't survive that hospitalization. If you look at heart failure, it's really serious. And again, when we compare children to adults, you know the children fare worse, and their, their mortality is higher than every age group of adults almost, even those aged you know greater than seventy. Um, uh, uh, that many of the children have a higher mortality rate than than even very older adults. So again, it's a uh, it's a very serious uh, uh, condition, and in part because they're you know in the hospital a long time, it's it's very expensive, and and it costs you know on average today about a hundred thousand dollars more for one hospitalization for heart failure to, to take care of adults, and I mean, children than it does does to take care of adults, and you know I'd love to be able to tell you that we've done such a great job in pediatric cardiology that. That we've improved the the care of children with uh, cardiomyopathy, so that hardly anybody needs a transplant. And why I, I do think we have made some very important advancements overall. The um, the risk of of a child either not surviving or or needing a transplant uh, for many cardiomyopathies is still quite poor. And this this slide is um, looking at dilated cardiomyopathies and. And um, just to sort of orient you to, to, to what this, uh, how this figure looks, is that um, this is, you know, how many patients have either survived or, um, or, or, or either died or needed a transplant. And, and if everybody survived, then it would be a flat line at 100%, you know, going, you know, horizontally. And the horizontal is, you know, how many years have gone by. And as these, as the line falls, those are the percentages of patients that have either died or needed a transplant. And and for dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, which is the most the most frequent cardiomyopathy that we uh, uh, you know transplant in terms of numbers, that that most most of the transplants for heart muscle disease are, are for patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. That um, about half of the children have either died or had a transplant by by five years, so it's it's a it's it's something that while we would love to be able to treat patients so they didn't need a transplant, 
a significant uh, number of patients with cardiomyopathy will uh, go on to um, to need a heart transplant. So why would we why would we think about you know transplanting a child? There are a lot of things that are good about a transplant, and there are a lot of things that are not good about a transplant. And so we we consider doing a heart transplant in a child because unfortunately not all serious heart diseases including cardiomyopathies can be managed effectively with either medications or surgery and if whatever heart disease is present if, if it advances to severe heart failure or advanced heart failure then there are often few or no other therapies that can offer long-term survival so it's in this scenario that we really start thinking about about heart transplant and I uh, I thought it might be interesting, and hopefully you'll agree, just to talk to you about, just briefly, about, well, how do we get to the point where we're doing heart transplants, you know, relatively routinely in children now? Um, this is nothing that, you know, happened overnight, and it was the, the work of, you know, you know, really decades and decades of, 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 of research and, in, uh, you know, clinical care to got to the point where we are today. So uh, this is... Uh, James Hardy, Dr. Hardy, who was the first person that ever performed a heart transplant. And uh, this is a picture from uh, um, the operating room. This was a big deal. This happened in, um, in uh, um, uh, Mississippi in the 1960s. And, and the first transplant ever done was what we would call a xenotransplant meaning that the heart was not taken from a person. It was actually taken from an animal. It was taken from a chimpanzee and it was put into the patient's heart, <laughs> and the patient uh, did not live very long. I think only survived about uh, 90 minutes. And this was um, you know, strongly criticized um, that, you know, was, uh, was really hard to conceptualize, that somebody would take a, an organ from an animal and put it into a human. And um, because of that, a lot of people really thought that that um, set back um, the field of heart transplantation. And this experiment was uh, relived in some ways in the 1980s. And I don't know if any of you uh, would remember this, um, if you were around at that time, uh, but I was. And it was a, um, this was a really big deal. So this was uh, in the early 1980s when a very severe form of heart disease called hypoplastic left heart syndrome, um, there were were just beginning to have some effective surgical strategies and a lot of uh, people were trying to do heart transplants in these patients and uh, just as there was a problem in the 1980s where there weren't enough uh, available hearts uh, there's that problem today and, and it existed then as well so what Leonard Bailey and his team at Loma Linda did was they transplanted this uh, young child baby Fay uh, was her name and uh, with a heart from a baboon and uh, unfortunately baby Faye did not survive for very long and she, um, she passed <coughs> excuse me and the uh, and this as well like Dr. Hardy's case was very strongly criticized and the ethics of this was really questioned and uh, because of that I think it would be very very unlikely that we would ever see this in the future of having an animal heart uh, transplanted into a person uh, um, uh, but some of the very um, early pioneers in making heart transplant a reality was this person here is Norman Shumway. He was at Stanford. He was a scientist and a surgeon and uh, uh, did great work in immunosuppression and was really able to extend the survival of heart transplants. And he formed the first, performed the first heart transplant in the United States. And he introduced a medicine called cyclosporin, which really made uh, organ transplant a reality. But he was not the first person ever to do a heart transplant, and that was Christian Bernard, and it was in 1967, and it was to a, uh, a young lady, Denise Darvel, that uh, was fatally injured in a car accident, and they talked to her parents about uh, allowing them to, uh, to use her heart for it, and they agreed, and um, they uh, transplanted this heart into Mr. Washansky, and he did okay for a while. He also didn't survive very long, but here's a picture of him after the surgery, um, and he's shaking hands um, with, um, uh, with Dr. Um, Bernard. And then, actually not very long after that, uh, just several months later, was the first pediatric heart transplant, 
Um, and that was performed in Brooklyn uh, by Dr. Kranchowitz. It was uh, with an infant, uh, to an infant with severe congenital heart disease, uh, but not great outcome. The patient unfortunately died uh, the same day as the procedure. So it really, you know, uh, took a while, uh, you know, to the 80s and really into the 90s um, in many places uh, before heart transplant was done uh, more um, routinely and commonly. And that's what this slide shows. So this is uh, from the International Society of Heart, Lung, and Transplant, so a, a big international organization um, which looks at not only transplants in the United States but also from around the world, though many of these are, are, are in the United States. And you can see that in the early 1980s, there were very few transplants being done, and it wasn't until the, you know, the really the 1990s where we see that the number of transplants really increased to about what they are today. You know, currently in the United States, we, you know, there are about 400, uh, 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 you know, 300, 400 transplants done every year, and um, and so it has become uh, relatively common. And you can see the age breakdown here. The purple are infants, so we do many heart transplants in infants, and uh, um, you know not that many in six to ten year olds in this red one, and roughly an equal number of people age one to five as as eleven to uh, as eleven to seventeen. Again, if you please, if you have any questions, just you know you know stop me. I'm happy to answer these at any time. All right, and again, who gets a heart transplant? Definitely skewed towards early ages, where we see infants and younger ages um, um, really get the bulk of the transplants. But then we again, as as children get into adolescence, we see a more number of transplants done um, after that. Well, one important question in thinking about preparing for transplant is, well, you know, how's my child going to do with a transplant? And um, and one of the reasons we don't uh, transplant everybody with a serious heart disease is because these transplanted hearts uh, you know don't last um, forever and you know on average a heart a trans a patient may survive uh, you know 16 to 18 years uh, a pediatric patient um, you know a lot of things can go into that and certainly there are a lot of patients who are alive 20 plus years after a heart transplant uh, but again, just to orient you to these, you know, curves. If if the survival was 100%, you know, it would be a flat line at the top of the figure. And then, as as these numbers go down over time, those are the percentages of patients that that are still alive. So, if we look at infants, you know, roughly half of the patients that were transplanted as infants are still alive 20 years later. Uh, but if we look at teenagers, those aged 11 to 17. Um, you know, it's about uh, half the patients are only alive after 13 years. So, ages are one of those factors which makes a difference. There are a lot of things which influence these, including whether you know a, a, a cardiomyopathy versus congenital heart disease, uh, how sick a child is at transplant, and I will uh, go over uh, you know some of these things uh, as well. All right, so when we think about cardiomyopathies that may need a transplant, uh, you know, really all cardiomyopathies, you know, may need a transplant. Um, you know, the the, the uh, it really depends on the individual patient and and how they're doing, um, and and you know other factors. But but unfortunately, no cardiomyopathy is is uh, immune. That you know, uh, or the possibility it would be you know com completely excluded. So these are, you know, the common cardiomyopathies that we see in childhood. Um, restrictive cardiomyopathy is the least common cardiomyopathy that we um, care for, uh, but it overall has a fairly poor prognosis without a transplant. And many centers, uh, including our center here at CHOP, are generally fairly aggressive about recommending a transplant uh, because many children will have um, uh, adverse outcomes um, without a transplant. Um, dilated cardiomyopathy um, is, is also a, is, is a very common cardiomyopathy um, that we see in childhood and um, it does contribute the greatest number of transplants are for patients with dilated cardiomyopathy but it's also important to know that there are many many patients with dilated cardiomyopathy that, that don't need a transplant and are managed very effectively with uh, 
with medicine. So um, uh, even though it makes up a lot of the transplants, uh, I don't want you to think if your child has dilated cardiomyopathy that it's it's you know it's a, a foregone conclusion that there are many patients that are managed well with medical therapy that, that do very well with that. Left ventricular non-compaction, oh, sorry, I just realized I have the wrong abbreviation there. It should be LVNC, not RCM. Uh, but in any case, it is a, uh, it's very heterogeneous in, in, uh, in, in how it can be, but certainly uh, some of those patients will, could definitely need uh, transplant. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, most patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will not need a transplant, certainly in childhood, and can be managed effectively without it, uh, but certainly, um, um, there are some patients with it that absolutely have very severe disease and will need a transplant. And we perform uh, at our center here, uh, you know, we'll have one patient a year, you know, one to two, usually patients a year, every other year, uh, that will undergo a transplant for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's, it's certainly um, um, more patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be managed um, uh, effectively medically. So when, when do we start thinking about, does a transplant make sense for a patient? It's really when we're talking about very severe disease, uh, when there's a high likelihood of death or major morbidity without a transplant. And is there no other alternative to improve the condition? Now this is oftentimes with congenital heart disease patient, is there a surgery that would make things better? Or for a cardiomyopathy patient, do we think uh, maybe their risk of sudden death is very high? That could be changed with a defibrillator. Uh, but, you know, if there's no other alternative, we start thinking seriously about a transplant. And sometimes the patient may survive, we think, you know, their survival risk may not be too bad, but, but they're just in, their quality of life is so low from heart failure, from their disease, that uh, we really want to start thinking seriously about a heart transplant. So these are uh, what would be generally considered very accepted indications. These uh, stage D of heart failure are ways that we as cardiologists classify heart failure. So stage D is, uh, is you know, the worst of the stages, there's A through B. And that's really for re refractory heart failure symptoms uh, requiring things like inotropes or ventricular cyst device or mechanical ventilation. So this is serious refractory heart failure. Uh, stage C is serious heart failure, but that is not quite as bad. Um, these patients generally have severe limitations of exercise or activity. Our younger patients, they may have um, uh, uh, be failing to grow. And we worry about the pressures in the lungs being too high. Um, that that could be a consequence of some severe forms of cardiomyopathies. If that becomes uh, too high, we can actually not perform a heart transplant. We even have to perform a heart lung transplant. So if we see that those pressures are becoming elevated, we, we definitely um, worry about that. And that can influence sort of the timing and considerations for heart transplant. And again, restrictive cardiomyopathies, that's one of those cardiomyopathies that can certainly develop um, a serious pulmonary hypertension. And, and that's definitely a scenario where we start thinking about um, heart transplantation. So uh, one thing that I do when I'm speaking to a family about uh, considerations for transplant is, um, well, what's good about a transplant? Um, well, what's good